You're listening to the Really Useful Podcast. This is the tech podcast for technophobes from makeuseof.com. Welcome to the show. My name is Christian Corley and joining me this week is Gavin Phillips. How are you doing, Gavin? Doing very well, Christian. Yeah, I've had a fantastic weekend. I've just eaten a really nice bit of Rocky Road. I know last week I told you about a very nice bit of brownie. This week I've got Rocky Road, so everything's looking good. Well, I'm delighted to hear that. Uh, whilst we're on the culinary chat, I've just had uh, slowly scrambled eggs with uh, oh, homemade nice. English sourdough muffins. Oh, incredible. So uh, just to uh, get you feeling hungry there, dear listener, we will move on. We've uh, got a collection of the latest uh, news that relates to you directly from the tech world. And we've also got some tips and tricks which are in the area of OpenAI slash ChatGPT and um, Trojans and uh, something that's important about Trojans that you probably don't know but should know. But we're going to kick off with Twitter which is beginning to remove legacy verified check marks. Uh, you may recall uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, the announcement of Twitter Blue and this monthly subscription to prove that you are verified, all that sort of thing. And, uh, I mean, a lot of people have been slightly perturbed by this. The latest development in this is that legacy... They call them legacy verified blue check marks, but in many ways you could call them legitimate verified blue check marks are being removed uh, on April the 1st, which you could have chosen a better date there. Um, Twitter verified, app verified, stated that on April the 1st, we will begin winding down our legacy verified program and removing legacy verified check marks. To keep your blue check mark on Twitter, individuals can sign up for Twitter Blue. And, uh, well, do you know, I didn't really give this too many thoughts because I've never had a blue check mark because obviously I'm not a legitimate person. And um, also, I w I'm not going to pay for one, because that would be very, very silly. But, you know, there are people too, this is actually vaguely, I wouldn't say important is the best word, but, for instance, William Shatner has tweeted about this. Uh -huh. and, you know, yeah, the William Shatner, the Shat, yeah. as we used to call him. <laughs> um, hey, Elon Musk, what's this about blue checks going away unless we pay Twitter? I've been here for 15 years, giving my time and witty thoughts all for bookkiss. Now you're telling me that I have to pay for something you gave me for free? What is this, the Columbia Records and Tape Club? <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, you can't argue with that, can you? I don't think you can at all. I, just removing legacy accounts just means it turns it from a system where it was, well, it had already been starting to be muddled up by Elon Musk and turning it into a bit of a joke already. And now it just means that the check mark means you've paid Elon Musk. That's all it means. It yeah. will mean yeah. nothing for actual verification of accounts. So, I don't know. Twitter did need... A bit of an overhaul in many ways, but the way Elon Musk not this one about it is it's making an absolute mockery of the platform. You know? It's an underhaul, and isn't it? It really is, you know. So he also said Twitter's legacy blue. Ver this is what Elon Musk has tweeted: Twitter's legacy blue verified is unfortunately deeply corrupted. So will sunset in a few months, but that's sunset for a system that means absolutely zero. It's very frustrating, I have to say. Yeah. Have you got a blue check? No, I've, I've never never been offered the opportunity. <laughs> I, I applied for one on uh, a couple of occasions. Every single time turned down as if I was some sort of uh, fly-by-night underhanded dodgeball. <laughs> you know? They, they saw you coming. They saw me coming. <laughs> um I don't know. I don't know. I think it was very much a lottery, to be honest with you. But um, I mean, so I'm kind of glad that I mean, it needed a better method. But the whole Twitter blue thing and paying for the blue check mark and then anyone being able to do that without verification, other than basically uh, some sort of um, paying money, isn't really the way to do it. It needed a better system. This isn't the better system. 
no. I, I was going to refer us back as well, I think, to maybe last podcast or a couple of podcasts back where accounts that have bought the Twitter Blue subscription are now being actively used in crypto scams. Yeah. Which was the whole reason that Musk, you know, wanted to buy Twitter or part of one of the reasons why he wanted to buy Twitter to begin with. It was, oh, there's so much corruption and there's so many crypto scams and it's all about these accounts that, you know, fly under the radar. Whereas he's actually introduced a system that's made it easier for these accounts to appear like legitimate yep. online sources and to mimic actual accounts because he got rid of most of the staff that were in control of stopping some of these accounts from actually impersonating people. Like, it's just a joke from top to bottom. It really is. Yes, it has got a bit silly. Uh, we'll move on to... Uh, on the topic of crypto scams, indeed. Uh, Linus Tech Tips, the YouTube account, which um, I think most of us have probably come across at some point, uh, has been hacked. An actual YouTube channel hacked with streams of crypto scam videos uploaded um this is uh really awful uh, linus tech, tech tips has uh, 15 million subscribers and it was hacked thanks to i think something to do with an open tab wasn't it um it was it's quite interesting actually um so the hack took place because of something called uh session tokens yes yes um and a session token is basically what is in your browser to say i want to remain logged into this website yeah. so you don't want to log into youtube all the time you don't want to log into twitter all the time so it creates what's called a session token mm -hmm. these live on your computer locally um and what's happened here is that someone has sent um an employee at the uh, linus tech tips part of their um i can't remember what part of it was but it was someone who deals with their sponsorship team basically and they've been sent um, malware in a PDF, which they've clicked, opened, nothing happened, and they thought nothing of it, which is kind of a red flag in itself. You know, if you ever open a file like that and nothing happens, it's usually a sign something bad might have gone somewhere else. Um, but they didn't really think anything of it, and it didn't trigger anything. But what happened in the background is it took a copy of everything in their google chrome browser and microsoft edge browser exported it sent it to uh the scammers or hackers whatever you want to call them uh where they extracted the session tokens um for their for the linus tech tips um youtube channel and also uh tech quickie which is another one they do yeah um and, and their other channel as well so they managed to get access to all of these channels and um there's a really interesting video that linus has released really detailing how this all worked and what was interesting is like he's obviously a very you know he knows what he's doing with tech obviously <laughs> and he was trying to reset their youtube channels and trying to like get the scammer out of their youtube but he couldn't do it because they actually had access to this token so all of the normal stuff like two-factor authentication uh resetting their stream token on youtube all of this stuff wasn't working because they would skirted the entire process and stolen the session token which yeah. meant they just had like unbridled access to everything until they finally figured that out which is it's quite bonkers really yeah it is it's really worrying um now you, youtube obviously needs to look at this and uh develop some uh, better security measures this isn't the, the first time a tactic like this has been used um various high profile accounts have been affected throughout 2022 and so far in 2023 including the official british army youtube channel although my sources tell me there's more people working on the british army youtube channel than are actually on the field um ooh. Uh, we're going to move on. Fire TV for less. Amazon expands its TV lineup, improves ambient experience. So basically, uh, you can buy a Fire TV that's actually a TV. And this is the second, the, the lower cost Fire TV 2 coming in 32 inch and 40 inch models, which, I mean, it's also not a bad kind of uh, display. It's got QLED displays as well. So uh, 
it's kind of uh, exciting to have the idea of uh, an Amazon TV with Amazon built into it and obviously with Alexa in there as well. Uh, the only thing is, I hate smart TVs, Gavin. Oh, I could could not agree more. <laughs> they drive me uh, up the wall. I, I don't have one. I've got an old school 36-inch 1080p Samsung, which has a Fire Stick built into the back, uh, plugged into the back of it. Yeah. Um, it's one of the reasons I've put off upgrading the television for so long is that I don't want any of this additional smart stuff that you can't get rid of. And if they decide to you know, sunset a service, which has happened with Samsung TVs, mm -hmm. you know, they suddenly switch something off. Like, it breaks your television like, yeah. outright. Like, yeah, why yeah. would you want yeah, that? Yeah. Well, that's the thing with this, isn't it? Because, I mean, I, like you, Gavin, I mean, we talked about this last week. I've just bought a new TV, but I don't use any of the features on it. I just plug Roku into the back of it and just use the Roku channel. Mm, yeah. Well, uh, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. But I'm looking at this, and then I'm thinking of an Amazon Fire tablet, okay? So on the lower end, the Fire TV 2 Series brings the built-on Fire TV experience to smaller sets. The 32-inch model is $199.99. The 40-inch model uh, is 1080p and $249.99. Now, I'm thinking to myself, how would you get Amazon out of one of those? And I'm thinking along the as with the Amazon tablets, you really, these days, with the Amazon tablets, you can't get Amazon's um, version of Android OS off. I really can't see any realistic way that you can use these TVs without having an Amazon account, which, I mean, you know, if you're in, if that's okay with you, then that's fine. But in terms of, like, selling it on, or if you suddenly decide that um, you're going to become privacy conscious, I mean, you don't decide you're going to become privacy conscious, you just suddenly one day the penny drops and you become more privacy conscious, and you think, ah, so I really think I need my TV spying on me. I don't need all this uh, Alexa stuff either. You know, when that happens, you're stuck with a TV, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. And, um, so I just think the whole concept of then having to try, go out and try and find what we would now refer to as a dumb TV, basically. Yeah. But there's no, like, there's no category on Amazon that says, I would like to find a TV without smart capabilities. And you'd actually find as well, if you do go out and try and specifically search for TVs without smart stuff, you find lots of limitations in, in things like uh, resolution. You might not find a 4K TV without smart capabilities. Um, and you might even be limited to even lower resolutions depending on, on the quality and cost. You might end up with something with like 720p or something. Which... Well, yeah, I mean, there's that or there's buy a monitor. And, and a sound oh, yeah, bar. buy a big monitor. Uh, yeah, monitors don't usually come with speakers built in. I know a few do, but most don't. So you probably need a sound bar as well. But I think that's really the only solution. Gosh, yeah, have a big monitor in your living room. I guess they're quite similar in any way, really, aren't yeah, they? I don't, most people wouldn't notice, I don't think. Yeah, well, interesting. I mean, I, none of it moves me to immediately upgrade although like you said actually to begin with they do look like good quality screens the the qled is a very good feature they've got really nice rich black um and nice uh, panel dimming across the entire screen so they would look really really good <laughs> okay we're going to move on to some uh, tech tips and tricks now and uh, yeah if you've listened regularly over the past few weeks, then you know we've been talking about OpenAI and ChatGPT and uh, topics surrounding those, uh, around, around that technology. Now, we haven't, I don't think, I think we've been pretty balanced on how important this is and what it can do and what it can't do, Gavin. But, uh, there's, I mean, there are problems with it, uh, with this technology, aren't there? Um, We've collected a list by a um, writer called Garling Wu, uh, six problems with OpenAI's chat GPT. Um, so I'm going to, because um, I've got my own uh, take on this, uh, which I've uh, garnered over the past few weeks. So I'm just going to go through one of the, each of these one by one, and then we'll have a chat about them, Gavin. Uh, so number one, chat GPT generates wrong answers. Yeah. Um, chat GPT, this is number two, has bias baked into its system. Number three, chat GPT might take jobs from humans. Number four, ChatGPT could challenge high school English. Number five, ChatGPT could cause real-world harm. And number six, OpenAI holds all the power. Now, there's some interesting points to discuss there, but before we do go into that, um, Gavin, over the past few weeks, I've noticed, 
and it can't be me. So it, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure I can't be the only one. But I've noticed when I um, instruct ChatGPT to do something, say the last for the last ten days, it hasn't done it as well as it did for the fortnight before that. Do you mean in terms of the response generated? Yeah, the quality, the quality of the response. Yeah, the quality of the response. Ah, mm. interesting. Uh, not necessarily something I've noticed myself. I've been switching between uh, GPT three point five and GPT four. The quality of GPT four, which is the the newer model launched uh, earlier this month, uh, is definitely better than GPT three point five, mm. but it arrives at its answers much, much slower than the original model. Um, overall, quality seems uh, fine to me, but it may, I mean, it will all depend upon what you're asking it, I suppose. I suppose. I mean, I haven't really changed uh, the type of things I was asking him, but uh, anyway, so we, we know that it can generate wrong answers, don't we? Um, and I think it's been proven on many occasions over the past few weeks and months that um, there is bias in the system uh whether it's been programmed or whether it's been you know collated um as course uh, uh, yeah, in in terms of the um the, the software running um i'm interested in chat gpt might take jobs from humans that's kind of interesting for us isn't it yeah i mean very very specific to what uh, you and i do in terms of writing and editing that's always been one of the things that people contend it will uh will we'll be out of a job quite soon <laughs> um <clears throat> but other jobs as well so there was a whole hoo-ha about uh chat gpt being used in a courtroom wasn't there mm. um and someone used it to fight was it a parking fine possibly um, it rings a bell yeah similar to that so and then obviously lawyers were saying well you know the chat gpt isn't a practicing lawyer you know he can't be in the courtroom and tell people uh how to fight a case and it was very much you know the everybody up and down all sorts of uh, jobs in society from the bottom rungs to the top were suddenly going oh gosh this thing looks like it could be uh, could be a bit dangerous to us political speech writers you're the ones who need to be looking over your shoulder <laughs> <laughs> yeah i yeah uh, I, I as we've talked about before i'm not 100 percent chat gpt is going to take jobs from humans just yet but there is an element of uh, certain jobs are going to have to get to grips with using tools like ChatGPT and other generative AI tools to streamline processes within their jobs. Um, and it's, I think, one of those you can't you can't rail against it. You're going to have to work with it. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, do you, what? Do you, I mean, do you have any particular concerns over OpenAI? chat gpt being a problem or having problems that can't be fixed in terms of its programming or holding all the power yeah or, yeah um, yeah open ai being so closed source i think that's one of the issues some people have with it isn't it we don't know a lot of what's going on behind the scenes or you know it should be an open source model but i mean with respect like uh well i was going to use twitter but that has recently changed to being closed source hasn't it yeah uh but like you know instagram facebook etc it's all the same sort of issues um maybe someone will come along and build a decentralized crypto based generative ai <laughs> well it's bound to happen sooner or later isn't it yeah well and it always solves all the problems as well yeah Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, Trojans are so-called because they sneak into your computer as something else. Um, it's basically, it's malware disguised as something else and, you know, it's derived from the uh, Greek uh, Trojan horse uh, legend. Um, and I'm not going to get into the who the Trojans were in the horse and all that sort of stuff because that's not really important right now. It's just, all you need to know is that it's a type of malware that is disguised as another piece of software or hidden in another piece of software. Um, now, the interesting thing is, uh, we, we've published an article called Can Trojans Replicate Themselves? And I think this is quite an important thing to know because um, Trojans are specifically specific types of malware um, and viruses and worms 
are a different type of malware. Now, viruses and worms will replicate, but Trojans will not replicate. Now, it might be that you have a Trojan on what is described as a Trojan on your computer that replicates because it's a virus, but that's never that's not a Trojan. That's been brought in by a Trojan. It can get a bit complicated, can't it, really? Yeah, absolutely. I think the key thing is to remember is, is where the name Trojan came from. Obviously, the Trojan horse story from Greek mythology. And that's the ideal way to remember it. The, the Trojan horse is what gets everything else through the door. It drops off the goods, <laughs> if you if, will. If you like, yeah. Payload. <laughs> yeah. The payload, even better. Uh, and then that's what starts doing uh, even more damage. Um so if you download a Trojan, it might might not be an immediate, well, it is an immediate risk, but it's not going to necessarily cause immediate damage. But yeah. it's once it starts calling in its reinforcements, basically, then that's when it gets serious and you can have very serious issues on your on your computer. Yeah, good way of putting that. So, I mean, it can come through um, email attachments, anything you download off the computer. Uh, uh, it couldn't come off a USB stick or anything like that if it was already on there or if it's been copied onto there and then given to you, whatever. The most important thing is make sure you've got some decent uh, antivirus software, security software suite running on your computer, at the very least Windows Defender. I, um, I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to mention it again. I'm very close to launching a campaign, I didn't mention this bit, against using Gmail and Outlook and any other web-based email because the, the main reason for using them was anti-spam and antivirus, you know, diverting those bad emails, the spam emails, the, um, the hacker emails, the malware emails, just diverting them away from a traditional email client inbox. It's just not happening anymore. And basically, we have the tools, install an email client, install a compatible antivirus tool plugin in that client, and just take control of the management of malware. Because Gmail and Google and Microsoft just aren't dealing with it anymore. And I don't know what's going on. I don't know why they feel that they don't have to deal with it. I, it's, you know, that, that was the selling point for webmail, and it's just not there anymore, is it? No, I think uh, maybe it's with the increased amount of people, the, the the sheer volume of spam and stuff that gets sent is it's boggling at times. Well, I mean, you say that, but I don't really. I mean, obviously, there's greater capacity, uh, great volume, but at the same time, it doesn't look any less like spam. So, yeah, that's interesting. I know actually, although um, uh, anecdotally, on my desktop Outlook account is always wow i get a lot of um stuff that doesn't even touch microsoft's built in um you know built in filter yeah built into outlook uh and i made a point a while back on twitter it's like how can it be 2022 or 2023 whenever i made the tweet and their filter how can it still be so so bad that it misses countless emails that use the exact same phrasing Yep, you know the terrible grammar, the obvious spam, and it just does not pick them up. So you have to spend time in your day going through and manually selecting things like, you know, block this domain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's like it's not acceptable, yeah. really. It's not really, especially in a podcast era. where we've just discussed AI. Yeah, for sure, it should be so much easier. Yeah, I think we're going to be coming back to this topic in future. <laughs> recommendations time it's that part of the show where uh, something that we've done or enjoyed or viewed over the past week is uh, shared with you dear listener it might be something that you uh, want to have a go with yourself uh, gavin i'm gonna let you go first okay yeah i've got a bit of a different one this week actually christian um <clears throat> excuse me so um i'm quite into uh, sim racing uh, I don't get a lot of time to do it, but I do like to keep abreast of what's going on in the world of sim racing. Um, so I'm not sure if this really counts as a recommendation or not, but there's currently a big hoo-ha going on in the world of um, Formula One esports. So the game uh, F1 2022, which was uh, last year's edition of the game, uh, it's currently the pinnacle of you know F1 esports. It's got a lot of top drivers. All of the Formula One teams have an actual team 
um, within the game, um, and they sponsor esports drivers to drive for them. Now, over the course of the last month or so, there's been a massive um, upsurge in people reporting cheating. Um, but it's not just like regular folks cheating online. Turns out, um, and I'll use careful words, but allegedly, a lot of the top F1 esports drivers have apparently been cheating. Oh! <laughs> using um using like hacks that allow them to basically use the like grip cheats which would increase the level of grip you have um and allow you to you know get your foot to the floor a lot faster without causing the car to spin out or experience wheel spin and what have you um so this has been going on for a few weeks now and there's been a few like little incidents where um, one driver accused another one, um, saying there's no way he could accelerate that fast, you know. Um, and then there was a, a follow-up incident where another chap, um, just before they're about to go onto a onto a race, a live race, um, alt tabbed his window from F1, the game, into. An open folder that was full of the cheats. <laughs> oh no! And not only that it was like the cheats, the last thing that had been clicked in that folder, because on Windows it highlights the yeah. last selected thing in a folder blue. It was like the cheat script manager, basically. Um, so the the young lad, poor thing, um, uh, had to quickly close the window, closed his stream, and then deleted the stream as well. Um, so there's a lot of um, stuff going on in the world of F1 esports. Now, this isn't like necessarily a recommendation, but maybe it's uh, like a, the opposite of a recommendation, in fact, in that you're not necessarily going to be able to go online and trust F1 esports um, because there's so many cheaters. And it's not just, like I said, regular folks like you and I that might just want to have a little race. It's people at the very very top of the game using these cheats to further their careers which is it's quite incredible really wow well so uh, yeah it's incredible that that actually is taking place and so blatantly i suppose uh suitably embarrassed the person concerned are they being fined or kicked out or uh... well this is it so um ea who now own it and code masters um, have not been particularly vocal about what's going to go on with all of the allegations against various drivers. And um, it's sort of falling a little bit on the community to try and spot what they think are incidents of cheating. Now, interestingly, um, the esports driver, now real world driver, uh, Jimmy Broadbent, um, who... Uh, recently released a video i think yesterday or the day before uh which covered a, a reddit post which the uh the creator of the cheat that all these people are using did an ask me anything on reddit so you know ask me anything about the cheats i've created um and he said by and large people will be able to get away with this because it's that imperceptible that unless you really 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 know what you're looking for you won't be able to spot it with the naked eye he also went on to suggest that up to 70 percent of people that he had watched were probably using the cheats that he had created at, at the top level which was just like that's a shockingly high number of people wow well i mean i'm not really sure how i can follow that with a recommendation, but I'm going to give it a go. Uh, there's a <laughs> device that I'm uh, looking at at the moment uh, for a review for Make Use Of, which will be going... I'd hoped it would be live already, but it isn't. Uh, it is called the Dotcase Explorer Pro. It's an active Kickstarter campaign. And what it is, it basically, it replicates... I mean, for instance, if you had a Nintendo Switch and you didn't have the dock, which you probably do because it comes with the dock... But if you know, you know, if you wanted to go portable and take your Nintendo Switch on a holiday, but you know, have the option to use it on the TV in your hotel room or whatever, like that, then you would need a some sort of portable dock, and the Dock Case Explorer Pro would fulfil that requirement for you. Uh, now it's just quite a small device. It has uh, 
two uh, standard USB ports. It has a USB C port. Uh, it uses USB um, USB 3.2 throughout, and it. Basically, it'll dock anything. So I've used it with a Switch, with the Steam Deck, with my Samsung tablet, with a Windows laptop, with a Linux laptop, and it will work with pretty much anything I've thrown at it. I've been really impressed with it. It's very, very good. It also has compatibility with the Apple M2 chip, so it should work on Apple computers as well, which is the only thing I wasn't really able to uh, try it out on. Now, these devices are currently funding on Kickstarter. The review device is really good. Uh, so if you are after a dock, I would recommend considering this. The basic price is $69, which is about £57 to you and I, Gavin. Uh, I imagine it'd probably be 20 or $30 more than that if it um, wants... I mean, it is... It's You know, the, the goal has been surpassed by about 10 times the required amount, so it's almost certainly in production. Uh, it's definitely worth checking out, I think, if you are after a docking station for a laptop, if you want to reduce uh, wear and tear, and you've got a USB-C port on your laptop, uh, reduce wear and tear on your cables, plugging in the HDMI, plugging in the USB cables, whatever, Ethernet port as well, it has one of those. So, yeah, I'm quite pleased with it. That sounds really good. The option to be able to switch between the various different types of handhelds is, is a bit of a game changer surely. Possibly, possibly I think just the fact, it also has a very useful LCD display on it as well um, it does have a single button, it's one of those devices with the, just like a single button for cycling through everything which I find to be just slightly annoying because um, you can't get to where you want to be <laughs> quick enough and you just go tuck, 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 through the menu <laughs> uh, but other than that, no I'm really impressed with it so uh, that's uh, go going live at some point this week on Make You so if you can check that out it's 25 days at the point of recording this so by the time you hear this it'll be about between 25 and 20 days to go on it still so you can still back it and get that uh, early bird price uh, before it uh, you know, ends up in the shops and costs a bit more uh, but that's my recommendation uh, well, which brings us to the end of this week's show. Uh, you've been listening to the really useful podcast, the tech podcast with technophobes from makeuseof.com, where uh, Gavin Phillips and myself, Christian Corley, uh, both uh, look after things, among other people. Uh, we'll be back for a new podcast next week. If you've any thoughts or uh, feedback for us, please uh, send them along via the website or to us on Twitter. You'll find the links for everything we've discussed in this week's show in the show notes. And if anything we've said is uh, useful to you or more particularly your friends and family, let them know and uh, show them how to subscribe. We're available pretty much anywhere you can get your podcasts. 